First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Rachel Lazaro, who is a wonderful person for inviting me to this great event in such a beautiful place. I love Spain and in particular Escorial is correctly referred to as the eighth wonder, wonder of the world, the seventh actually, the monastery. So I'm going to have a presentation which is easy to follow. I'm not going to sit, I'm going to move around. It's going to be interactive, at, at times entertaining, so I'm sure that you won't fall asleep. What I'll do, I'll do 40 minutes, then 10 minutes pr uh, break, and then another 40 minutes. So it is very important that we make the sound work because this presentation has a lot of sound as well. So let me see now what this will work, and I have a remote control as well. The sound is working at the moment. Can you hear me? So, you see, I'm just um, using the, the metaphor wind of change, because what's happening nowadays, thanks to the recent advances, is really a wind, wind of change. So this is the online of the presentation. Uh, you're going to see all this in the next uh, 90 minutes. Uh, this is just for your information, to know what, you, what to expect. And um, probably the most Im interesting part is the last one, where I'm going to act. I'm not a clairvoyant. I don't know whether there are clairvoyants in mind readers here. Maybe not, but we'll try to predict the future with your help. So just to be clear, I want to have a few disclaimers. All the text of this presentation has been written by me, by a human. Uh, a couple of my students helped me with designing a few slides and the translation into Tamil, this is one of the studies I'm going to report, uh, was checked by a native speaker and several images were generated by ChatGPT4. So these are key terms. You can see uh, the key terms that I'm going to cover. Um, you can see those with abbreviations so that I have to speak a bit faster. I hope you'll understand me. If you don't understand me, if you think that I'm speaking too fast, let me know and I'll slow down. Because I have more than 160 slides to cover. This is why I cannot uh, go very, very slowly. So let me start with something very easy and something which I'm going to call background. Language, uh, computers and humans. We're going to look, because computers and humans are here main agents in this, in this uh, um, scenario, in this setting. So I'm going to define, for those of you who don't know what natural language processing is, what it is. It's a major com component of artificial intelligence and is also people, either, most of the people who work on natural language processing are either computer scientists or linguists or computational linguists. They, they actually con convert uh, to people who know both. So this is an interdisciplinary field which has to do with the processing of human languages by computers. Na the human languages are called natural languages. You'll see in a second. So those are terms that are widely used, uh, computational linguistics, natural language processing. So you see that I have ordered them, I have ranked them in such a way that the more I go down, the more applied it becomes. So computational linguistics is almost synonymous to natural language processing, but has a little bit of more theoretical slant. Natural language processing is more applied. Uh, and natural language engineering even more, but it's a bit obsolete as a term. By the way, I see that you very dil diligently started taking notes which is good, but if you need the presentation, you can send me an email and I can share it with you. So you don't have to write everything down. So I'm starting with a, with a very easy definition, natural and artificial languages. So what are natural languages? Those are natural languages, those are languages such as Greek, Spanish, uh, English, but also dead languages like uh, Latin, Asian, Greek, languages which are spoken now or which have been spoken in the past. And the artificial languages are the ones that have been coined, developed by humans to uh, facilitate communication. So you can see here languages like Esperanto, which unfortunately didn't take off. Now English plays the role of Esperanto, but also the Morse code, but also programming languages and the musical scale is also an artificial language. If you cannot see where from there, you can sit down here. Okay. So, um, just to give you a flavor of what natural language processing includes, I'm going to list a few, not all, a few of the topics that I have worked on to see what kind of applications we have. I have put some of the topics in red or in green. The reason I've put them in red and green because those are topics that I have more 
significant or seminal contributions to, um, but I have worked on much more than that. But this gives you simply uh, an idea of what natural language processing covers. And much more, of course. So I am one of my legacies, as Dr. Lazaro said, is the research group in computational linguistics at the, at the University of Wolverhampton, which is still being cited a lot, even though it doesn't exist anymore. Now I'm a Lancaster. So let's go back in time. We're going to go back, back in the in the past. We're going to go back, well, to so, sometime in the last century. Does anybody know when was the first computer invented or developed? Any ideas? I know that this is. A, this is an academic debate and also a historical debate, but I'm going to give you the answer. It depends actually on the literature you read. If you read German sources, I mean, I tend to believe the German sources because I studied in Germany, lived in Germany 11 years. It's like my second home. It was Konrad Susi who developed the first computer. Z3 was the 43 one. Then the, in the United Kingdom in 44, at that time it was the British Empire. Then in Bletchley, another computer, more advanced, was developed, which cracked the German code, the Nazi code. And then in '46, we had ENIAC in Pennsylvania. So maybe the German one, the first, followed by the British, followed by the American, but the second was a bit more advanced than the first, the third was a bit more advanced than the second. So let's forget about academic debates and let's agree that the first computer was developed somewhere in Germany, Britain, the British Empire or the United States between 43 and 46. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because I want you to remember those years, 43, 46. Because only one year after that, what happened? Well, this is a nice song by Chicago, the beginning. For those of you who love this music, type of music, the reason I'm playing this song because this is the beginning. This is the beginning of machine translation, which started in 47, only one year after the first computer appeared. So at that time, we had four, uh, Weaver, who was an American statistician and mathematician. He said something which he thought it was true, but it turned out to be a fiasco. He said that machine translation is very easy because we can take a source language, we can encode it, and then decode it into a target language. And this is how machine translation works. So his idea was very simple, in fact, very naive. So if you ask me whether he was right, I'm going to tell you he was wrong. And I'm going to tell you that he, would be, he wouldn't have succeeded, he would have failed, even if he had the supercomputers of today. Why? Well, I'll tell you in a second. But at that time, we had some, so this was the idea, language one, language B, and it didn't work, and in the 50s and the 60s, it was connected with the concept of artificial intelligence, the first artificial intelligence concept, and then it failed, and research in machine translation stopped for about 30 years, unfortunately. But it was not working to such an extent that some textbooks started including jokes, things that didn't exist. Like there is a very well-known textbook by Doug Arnold and Louisa, Louisa Sadler, published in 94, called Practical Guide to Machine Translation, still good, a bit out of date, but they were saying that there was um, English to Russian and Russian to English machine translation program which translated the biblical sentence, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak, into Russian and then back into English and the back translation was the vodka is strong but the meat is rotten. Uh, I've never seen this, this, pro this machine translation program, it was a joke. Obviously, the translation from Russian was strategically important in the Cold War. But this comes to show that machine translation was, at that time, was a, re a real failure. So it didn't work. So at that time, the problem was that there were many, many limitations. So at that time, computers were slow and unreliable. So it, it didn't have the resources, the computational resources. Programming languages al were almost non-existent. So how can you develop a machine translation program? If you cannot def write a program, you cannot code them. You had assembler and then with the machine, uh, you had a machine language and assembler which were extremely difficult to, to be implemented. And then there was no adequate theory of language. At that time, the only theory was Shannon's information theory which came out in '49 because influential theories like Chomsky generative grammar only uh, came to existence in '56. So in the 40s, in the early 50s, it was a difficult time for machine translation. So why did he fail? 
this is what I've just said. He would have failed even if he had the supercomputers of today. His view is very simplistic and most importantly, not less importantly, language is regular and ambiguous. Language is not mathematics. Language is different from mathematics. So he was assuming language is mathematics. This was his mistake. So why is language regular and ambiguous? We're going to see in a minute. So I want to ask you to read this sentence. The box is in the pen. And if there are any native speakers of English, please don't reply to my question. But my question now is, is anybody who is a native speaker of English? OK, so everybody can reply then. Do you think it makes sense, this sentence? Does it make sense at all? It makes sense? Very good answer, because in 99% in of the cases, I'm told it is not possible, because people think of this scenario, which doesn't work. But you're right, that pen has more than one meaning. Pen could be a, a, a playpen for children, or pen could be an animal pen where you keep the animals. So some of you have learned now what is the answer to this question. It depends on the meaning of the word pen. So if I ask you, next week or in one month or in one year you know the answer you know you'll tell me yes it's possible depending on the meaning of the word pen so why because we humans can learn this is something very important we have been always able to learn including in the 50s what do you study linguists so yes good uh, your observation your observation was correct but barkhill then made a very important comment that machines that cannot learn like humans will not be able to consistently translate well. So obviously he was making the point, he was arguing that you can only translate well if you understand it, if you can learn like humans. So this was very important. So now you know that we as humans can learn. So if I ask you, what is your name? Irena. Irena. If I ask you the question, you know the answer. Because a few minutes ago, I told you the answer and you have learned. So what was the situation then? So. We had computers then, and we had humans then. We have computers now, and we have humans now. So in the 40s and 50s, computers were not able to learn. But humans were able to learn. And now we have a different situation. Thanks to machine learning and deep learning, they have changed the landscape, and our computers can learn on the basis of data. I'm going to go into this in more details in a few minutes. So, however, still, processing of language is a challenge. And this is something we need to be aware of. And I want to make this point very emphatically. Language is irregular and ambiguous. And I'll, I'm going to give you a few examples which will make you smile. So this is a ex real example from Havana, La Havana, Cuba, where a Cuban friend asked his friend, how do you say Pope in Spanish? And you can understand. You know that Papa, Papa in Cuban Spanish means potato and also Pope. So obviously, this is lexical ambiguity. And as a result of this, we have this welcome potato welcoming the Pope. And this is a real example. This is not a made up example. And then this is the so called lexical ambiguity because it has to do with the different meanings of words. You, we have also syntactic ambiguity, semantic ambiguity, and other types of ambiguity. Let's have a look at semantic ambiguity. So the rabbit is ready for, for lunch. So in semantics, those of you who study semantics, you have the so called semantic roles. And in this example, the rabbit is happily going to start to eat. So the rabbit has the semantic role of agent. But then we can have a situation where the rabbit has been cooked and is to be eaten. This is the semantic role of patient. So depending on the different semantic role, this sentence has more than one meaning. This is called semantic ambiguity. And another example of semantic ambiguity is the following. If you read the sentence, we serve only men here. So focus on the English sentence. Uh, so it, the men can have the semantic role of recipients. They're the ones to receive the drinks, to be served the drinks. But men could be also on the menu. So men's, men are on the menu, so they are served there. So in English, it has two meanings. The semantic role of recipients, the men being served, and being on the menu, patient. In Spanish, it wouldn't be ambiguous because you'll have a preposition which will disambiguate. However, in my native language, in my mother's tongue, Bulgarian, it has three meanings. Because men could only have, could also play the role of an agent, which means 
we are the men who serve here. So you see, triple ambiguous. Uh, and this is an example of anaphoric ambiguity. If you read this sentence, what is it? Is it your head or is it the bomb? What do you put in the bucket? You could have the bomb being put in the bucket. This is a well-known Second World War British anti-raid leaflet. But you could have a situation where you, you, you actually lose your head, you take your head and put it in the bucket. Uh, anaphorically ambiguous. Humans will understand this, but some people or computers won't. So we have further challenges. We have phraseology. Do you know that um, we can have not, you know that we have not only single words, but we have also multi words expressions like idioms, like collocations. And interestingly, until 20 years ago, we did not know that in, every la in most languages we have more multi word expressions than single, single words. And those multi word expressions, which are studied in a discipline called computational phraseology, they cause problems. And this makes language processing even more difficult. Fly off the handle. Do you know what it means? This is a multi-word expression. This means to lose temper suddenly. You see, it's not literal meaning. So humans and computers, especially computers, have difficulties with those. So language is irregular, ambiguous, and now phraseological. So language is different from mathematics. We shouldn't forget this. And this was the mistake the first computational linguist made. So you have studied mathematics. You know that relationships can be formulated in theorems. And this is a well-known th theorem. If you take any triangle, any two sides, if you take the sum of their length, the number is greater than the length of the third, third, uh, third side. You know this. You've studied this in school. This is well-known. So. And the reason why it is a theorem, because this is always valid as a statement. It doesn't matter what triangle you take, it, it is always there. So let's try to formulate some theorems for language. Each word has only one meaning. Could this be a theorem? What is your name? Catalina. Sorry? Catalina. Catalina. It's an easy question for you, but could this be a theorem? No, it, theorem means the statement is always valid. No, no. I mean, if we were to invent an artificial language in which that sentence is easy, yes, but it's not. Yes, we're talking about natural languages. You're right. In natural languages, it cannot be a theorem. What about this one? Each sentence can be interpreted in one way only. What is your name? Gabriela. Gabriela. Could this be a theorem? Is it always true? No. Correct. What about this one? That reference is pr produced by all citizens of Madrid are sincere. It cannot be a theorem, this is obvious. This looks like a theorem. If we assume English about 10 years ago used to have 500,000 words, Span uh, German used to have 250,000 words. So we can f plot this nicely in a linear function, y equals 2x, whereas y is the number of words in English and x the number of words of German. So this looks like a theorem because it is expressed as a linear function. Do you agree with me or not? Is this a more difficult question? Could this be a theorem? Why it's not a theorem? Exactly. This is the right question. So it could be true today, but in 10 years' time, this linear function may not hold. So it cannot be a theorem. Well done. OK, so why we had so many problems with language? Because language is different from from data, different from mathematics. So we had this program, Deep Blue, which was de divined, designed and implemented by a Taiwanese PhD student in, at MIT. He developed a program called Deep Blue, which was able even to beat Kasparov. But why, why did it work in the field of chess, and why didn't it work in the field of language? Well, th is anybody here a good chess player? Any grandmaster? Well, why we, as he, n who are not grandmasters, play chess, but we can only predict two, three moves in advance. Why? This is what we do. But the grandmasters, they can predict 25, 30 moves in advance. This is why they're so good. But this program, Deep Blue was able to scan one million moves, one million moves in a second. So how, how can a human being compare? Even being more creative, sometimes we'll lose. This is why this program beat Garek Kasparov, the reigning champion then. 
So we have a lot of challenges um, in terms of language, both for computers and humans. And uh, I'm going to ask a question, which I'm sure that you'll agree with me. Uh, are humans always very good? Are they doing better than computers? So I'm going to give you a human example. A recorded information line in Australia, you call a telephone number and you have an automatic message which says, if you understand English, press one. If you don't understand English, press two. So this is a real example from Australia, a recorded uh, telephone line. So now I'm going to play a little video for you about the German Coast Guard. <laughs> An example which shows that even humans have difficulties understanding things. So why do we want computer to be so perfect? So I'm going to give you the history of natural language processing, how it evolved in three minutes only. So natural language processing started with the so-called rule-based methodology. Basically, you have rules for every task, you develop rules. So this is the task called word sense disambiguation. This is a natural language processing task where you take a word and the program tells you what is the meaning of these words in a particular context, because as we know, words are polysimous. So let's consider the word bank. So this is a rule-based algorithm. It's an informal algorithm which says, OK, search in the context of this word. If we have uh, words such as um, finance, savings, money, then this is a financial institution. If you have words such as river, water, walk, fish, it is most probably the river bank. So th those rules implemented in the code can disambiguate the word bank. Or this is another example of a rule-based approach, an for resolution If you read those two sentences, the soldier shot at the woman and they fell. The soldier shot at the woman and they missed. We, we as humans know that in the first case, they are more likely to be the soldiers. In the second case, they are more likely to be the women, but the computers do not know this. So how, do it, how did we what kind of algorithm did we use to write? We have rules like if x shoots at y and z falls, z being either y or x, then more likely z to be y, and then the second rule. So you have to have rules for every situation. In other words, we have to describe the whole world by encoding rules like this for every particular situation which is impossible. This is why we can see that rule-based methodology wasn't optimal. Then machine learning came. This is an example of a machine learning program which identifies spam. It looks at examples. Those are the examples. This is an example of a spam. This is an example of no spam. So the program learns from those examples. It uses so-called decision trees. C405 was one of the best known machine learning algorithms. And the next time it comes across a word, it predicts whether it's a spam or not. So this is machine learning. Then, and then this is a song by James Brown from 66, which was the called it used to be called, it's still called the Men's Men's World, a very famous hit. Today we're far away from a men's world, we're more a woman's world as we know, but in particular, we are a world of deep learning and large language models. So we are a world of this methodology and this is going more and more like this. So we have a deep learning which emerged more or less in 200, 2015, which is like machine learning, but a more advanced form of machine learning because it has several layers of machine learning networks. So uh, it, holds, it, it started working very well. And since not 2015, I've been encouraging all my PhD students to use deep learning in their PhD thesis. Um, and then we had also neural machine translation based on deep learning. And we have now the large language model generative AI, where which works by taking an input text and re predicting the next token of a word. And now all my PhD students, I'm encouraging them to use and compare deep learning with large language models in their PhD dissertations. So this is the evolution of natural language processing from rules through networks to generative AI. So now 
I'm going to reply, trying to reply a very important and pressing question, also a worrying question. Many people are worried. Is generative AI taking over? Are large language models always better than the deep learning models or the, the rule-based models? This is something very important. We need to know about this. So I'm going to show you a few studies. The first one, this is a paper to be published in the, uh, in the journal in the autumn. Um, we try, this is a, a work where we extract automatically metaphorical names of flowers and plants. We do it for English, Spanish, and Chinese, and we're planning to do it for, for Italian as well. So basically we use data like English and Spanish cobra, which were compiled on the basis of Encyclopedia of Flower and, Sp and Plants. In Chinese, we did a similar thing. We divided, developed data sets. And um, we have many plants which are not only single names, but also multi-word expressions. And um, these are examples of, uh, forget me not, is a flower, which is a multi-word expression, also in Chinese. And those are the data. Train sentences are the sentences that we train the deep learning models on, and the test sentences are the part of the corpus which we evaluate on. This is how it works. You have to have part of the corpus for training, where machine learning and deep learning approach is trained, and then another part is reserved to evaluate the project to develop. This is how it works. Um, so I'm going, to f I'm going to comment on those figures. So those are state-of-the-art deep learning models. This is a rule-based model, which we should ignore because we just, I asked my students to develop it overnight, so it's not very good. But I want us to fo focus on the deep learning models and the, and the large language models. We can see that the best performing ones is SLM Roberta Bayes, a multilingual case. So this is by far better than ChatGPT and the other large language models for English. So this example shows that large language models are not better than deep learning when we try to identify metaphorical names for flowers and plants. For Spanish, however, interesting. Uh, Lama, which is a large language model, does best. It is ahead of the deep learning models. If you look at Chinese, for Chinese, again, we have the deep learning model having the upper hand, and ChatGPT for Chinese is the best performing uh, deep, uh, large language model for this task. So those, I'm reporting those figures to you because I want us to see to what extent generative AI is becoming better and better because we are afraid, many people are afraid that we'll lose our jobs, not me, but many other people because I'm going to tell you what I think about it at the end of the presentation. Uh, so, so those actually results, those studies give an answer to those questions because if, if large language models are always better, then obviously we're stuck, we're really doomed. So here, we see that for Chinese, again, large language models are not the best. The best. Then I'm going to give you an example of another task, name entity recognition in Holocaust data. Uh, this is a topic one of my PhD students is working on at the moment. She's, the, initial, the, the, the original topic was to automatically generate bios of well-known historical personalities. So this was the initial topic, and this is a part of this study where we extract names of people in the Holocaust um, era during the Second World War. So this is part of another study, which for those of you who are corpus linguists, this is a very important um, study, uh, a question that nobody has been able to answer. People have been speaking, but I wanted to find out whether what matters is the quantity or the quality. So some people say, okay, what is important is to have data, data, data. It is very true that nowadays, without data, we're stuck. But is data always the solution? Can we take any data? What, what if you have huge amount of data as opposed to minimal amount of data, but the minimal amount is better quality? So this was another study that I conducted, and this was part of this study. What matters more is quality or quantity of data? This was a um, cover slide of another keynote speech I gave. But let's go to the um, to this study. So basically, I use automatic extraction and translation and multi-word expression from comparable corpora to find out the answer to this question. And uh, probably, uh, do you know what comparable corpora are? Those are very important. This is a very important concepts in corpus linguistics. So those are 
corpora which basically discuss, they're not translations of each other, they're not parallel corpora, they have a similar sampling frame, they, they actually discuss, they, come, they discuss a similar same domain or same, similar domain, but they're not translations. So they are equally representative, also they are within the same time period. So those are comparable corpora. So this is the definition, the best known definition by Tony McHenry, who is a colleague of mine in Lancaster. So in this study, I used collocations. Um, we automatically extract collocations. And uh, idioms are also multi-word expression, as you know, just like it is raining cats and dogs. So uh, talking about collocations, what I developed was a methodology which was knowledge poor because it didn't rely on translation resources. It only used comparable corpora. The idea was to identify which are the collocations, which is not always trivial, and then once you identify them, both in English and in Spanish, to get a translation in the other language. So this was the study. Uh, and here are a few examples of collocations. And since you know what collocations are, don't you? So I'm going to give you, I'm going to have a, a few tests. What kind of collocation is this? Could you guess it? Sorry? Well done, well done, pay attention, yes. What about this one? No? Sorry? Take bribes. What about this one? Any ideas? Bear hug. What about this one? This is a difficult one. Yeah, yeah, correct. Reading glasses. And this one? Those are funny collocations. Those are, sorry? Well done, yes. Those are actually like uh, funny, uh, funny cartoons. And finally, this one. Try to use your imagination. So you see a flower which is a bit, a bit wild, isn't it? Wild flower. <laughs> okay, so this methodology automatically extracted collocations and automatically translated them from English into Spanish, Spanish into English. This was part of a Marie Curie project which I gained from the EC. This is why I was a Marie Fellow. And it gave very good results. And we use this, those results to, to identify, to find the answer to the questions, what is better, huge corpora of poor quality or small corpora of better quality? So the results were that um, size indeed matters. The larger the size, the better the performance. However, what is very important, as long as the quality is above a minimal threshold, this is very important. So only huge corpora is not sufficient. You have to have minimal quality. I'm not going to show figures, but if you want to read more technical details, this is a paper that was published. I can share it with you. When you, when you send me an email to request the presentation, I can also send you some of those papers or relevant papers that I'm talking about. So I'm going to, so I'm going, I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to this study. The, um, uh, the, the name entry recognition in Holocaust data. So we use two types of data, clean data, better quality ones, narratives. I mean, you see this is a narrative, coherent narrative, or questions and answers. Uh, this is sort of a noisy data because na language processing has difficulty. They struggle with data which are not coherent and narrative. So here, the data, we class them as noisy, not as good quality. Uh, so I wanted to have a look at the results. Here are the large language models, Mistral and Falcon. Here are the transformer models. My PhD student developed a new transformer model called Holobird for Holocaust data. So this was her uh, transformer model. You can see that it is the best performing one, both for clean data and for noisy data. And I, I'm going to come back to this slide later in my presentation because I wanted, I wanted to have a look at the performance figures of Mistral and Falcon. It's even lower than the rule-based model, which shows that rule-based models are still not to be forgotten. But here we have a situation 
where basically definitely deep learning is better than large language models. And I promise to give you a break in 40 minutes, so how, how many minutes do we have until 40? Uh, so, what time did we start? Ten minutes more, and I'll give you a break. Okay. So, look at those figures. This this is very important. So, in this case, the deep learning model does fares best in here as well. So, on both types of data. So, another case study: an alpha resolution is one of the most difficult NLP tasks. Um, this is a paper which has been just published in a journal. And um, this was based on a keynote speech I gave at the big ICON conference in India in December last year. The reason I chose this song, it was a hit in 68. You were not born then, but I was. Those were the days. It's a Mary Hopkins composition composed by Paul, Mar Paul, Paul McCartney. And the song was, those were the days. So in this paper, we're asking the question, I'm asking the question, are all based methods things of the past? Those were the days when we had them. And if you look at this table, which is probably, before I show you the table, I'll, I'll give you an example of an alpha resolution. This is a sentence, John put the wine on the table. It was round and brown. It is in fact, the table, not the wine. But sometimes people pause until they find the answer. And computers have difficulties with this example. And I'm not going to explain why. This is because of the word, of the noun phrase, the table being, uh, the, being uh, the, noun, the noun phrase, the wine being more salient than the, the table. But I'm going to show you here the results. I don't know whether you can see them well. But here, the best performing models are the deep learning ones, better than ChatGPT, and the original algorithm which uses uh, antecedent indicators is further down, but the original algorithm, the rule-based one, does better than some deep learning models. And here ChatGPT does comparatively well only if it's helped by us. We tell ChatGPT, look, look, this is the list of possible antecedents, and choose one of them. And in this case, we don't give any help. And this is why it doesn't work so well. But the conclusion here is that deep learning does best on this task, OK? So another case study, machine translation. So I'm trying to, f to find out whether large language models are better, whether generative AI is getting better and better. So this is the main uh, theme here. So this sentence, taken from the Longman Dictionary of Idioms, Here's one in the idiom, kick the bucket, which means to die, right? I exper this is a very simple thing. I experimented in 2015 with some statistical machine translation programs. And in 2018, we had already neural machine translation based on deep learning. And I tried several programs, from English into Spanish, so that you can see the quality of the sp translation into Spanish. Is everybody Spanish here? Sir? Everybody? Who is not Spanish? Okay, thank you. But you speak Spanish, don't you? Okay, so this is a uh, sentence. Prompt was a very famous program from the 90s, developed in Russia. Uh, look at the translation, especially read the translation of to kick the bucket. Absolute rubbish. Then, then with Sistran, which has been adopted in DC for many years, equally bad translation. Here we have uh, Google Translate, which does a better job in the sense that esterara la pata is correct, but it doesn't conjugate the verb. And DeepL, at that time, we had a deep learning uh, program, does a very poor job. So this was 2018. And I did those experiments between 2012, 2018, always failing on multi-word expressions, always failing. But, but in 2023, in September, I was invited to give a talk in Granada and I did a few experiments with the same sentence. I actually tried DeepL in September 2023, less than a year ago. Look how better it does. And then I tried also Google Translate, very good translation, isn't it? Only in about in a period of three, four years. They have improved dramatically. And then even ChatGPT did a great job. 
Why? Because we have a situation where we have huge data which help a lot improve the algorithms, the translation engine. So obviously in machine translation things are getting better and better. For some people a bit worrying. Um, let's have a look at another case study. Automatic generation of multiple choice tests. This is one of the topics I have published and work a lot. So multiple choice tests are an effective way to, to measure the student achievement. It's used in many countries, mostly in the States, less in Europe, but they're still used. And developing and writing multiple choice tests is something which is time consuming and labor intensive. So this is an example of a multiple choice test. There is one correct answer. In this case, the correct answer is Naples, but, but the other two answers are incorrect. So the student has, or the testee has to pick the correct answer. However, interestingly, uh, the distractors, the wrong answers have to be plausible so that if they're not plausible, somebody will be able to guess very easy. So for the first time we published in 2003, we developed a natural language processing methodology. This was the one which was adopted by the National Board of Medical Examiners in the States. They use it even today. In the States, when you study six years medicine, you have to go through exams before they, you're licensed to be a doctor. And a great part of their exams are based on this methodology that I developed. They use them in the States on a daily basis. Um, so, so recently we developed a new method um, to generate questions from paragraphs based on deep learning. So the premise is that questions should focus on key concepts and the distractors are semantically close to the correct answer because otherwise people will be able to guess very easily. This is an example of a really genuinely generated question by our system. Syntax studies the way words are put together into sentences. So what the system will do would identify which is the important concept in this case, syntax. And then this, this is the multiple choice test generated. You can see that the question includes not syntax but a superordinate, the branch of linguistics, which can be identified from WordNet. And syntax is the correct answer, but the distractors are similar concepts because if you, if you say, if you offer chemistry or football or beer, everybody will be able to guess. So what is important is to generate automatically plausible distractors. So I want to see how, how large language models do in this case, because our natural language processing methodology did a very good job. Not always perfect, but still good. So this is the prompt. I'm asking, I'm giving this sentence again. I want them, I want ChatGPT to generate a multiple choice test. I've given it a score 4.5 out of five. It did a good job. Then I tried another large language model, well, the same one, which is called Claude. It, does a, it, does, it doesn't do such a good job because the detractors are too distant from the correct answer. This is a very well-known large language model. I'll speak about it later. Um, so this is um, Claude 3 again, but um, I'm just, it now it does even worse because the questions and the options do not make sense. Then Gemini, this is a large language model developed by Google. Uh, look at the output. And um, it's, it's actually, if you read this output, you can see that basically it's okay, -ish, but it's a bit confusing. So um, I wouldn't give it more than three score here. So a more challenging task would be to generate multiple choice tests from paragraphs, not from single sentences. So we have, I mean, the, in the initial task that we had, we have a sentence, generate a multiple choice test automatically. And this was very good for lecturers, for students, because you have a textbook, electronic textbooks, and you run the program and it generates automatically multiple choice tests. This was the whole idea when I started this project back in, in the early 2000s. But now we have a situation where you have not only one sentence, but several sentences, a paragraph, and you need your program to get the gist, the meaning of the whole paragraph to, to generate one multiple choice test based not on one sentence but on the whole paragraph, which is a more challenging task, by the way. So here is the paragraph. Mm. Uh, so basically, I asked ChatGPT to generate a question, multiple choice test question, so this is what it generated. I scored it 0 0.5 out of 5 because it's not testing essential knowledge. What is asking is well, which term is obsolete. I wanted the program to test knowledge about syntax. So basically this is why I'm not giving it a high score. 
Gemini did very poor job. All options are wrong. So this is a very difficult task for large language models. They're not doing perfect jobs here at all. Uh, Mistral is a large language model developed by a French company. It's, it's, it's free, it's not, you don't have to pay for it. The distractors can be easily guessed here, you can see. And this is a model developed in the United Arab Emirates in response to the fact that the, all the large language models, most of them are developed for English. It's a very good large language model, and it's free, by the way. I'm giving it, I've given it a score of 4 out of 5. So Falcon does a very good job. So let's see, is it time for a break or not yet? OK, I'll give you now the promised 10 minutes break, and then we'll continue after that. So it's, t it's time to start again, right? Or do you want us to wait? Are there many people, are several people missing? Or? Shall I wait for a minute or two? So this is, uh, what I'm trying to see here is how large language models compare, compare, uh, compile comparable corpora to see whether they're good at that. So um, I, tr I experimented with ChatGPT for zero to latest model, Cloud3, in Germany to see how they do. Um, no, I haven't played with it. I know about it, but I haven't used it. Is it good? Well, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you a leaderboard after that, um, so we can see where it is. So first of all, I, I asked ChatGPT to compile a comparable corpora in English and Spanish. Well, ChatGPT did a very poor job, because comparable corpora are not parallel corpora. They're not translations of each other. They are corpora which discuss similar topics. So you see the t text gener generated in English, and this is in Spanish, exact translations. So I've given it a score of 0 out of 5. Then when I asked ChatGPT to give me a concise and clear metric for comparability, it does a better job. It uses um, cosine similarity, TFIDF, term frequency inverse document frequency vectors. And this method actually does deliver uh, comparability results, so this is why I've given it 4 out of 5. So in fact, it gives me the answer to this one, but on the other hand, when I ask to, c to c compile, Cooperate did a bad job. So Gemini, this is the one developed by Google. Um, I asked the same question to compare comparable corpora not exceeding 500 words in English and Spanish related to artificial intelligence. Uh, in the, well, well, they chose uh, artificial intelligence, but here are the results. Um, so it doesn't know what comparable corpora is, the same thing. So this is why I've given it a score of zero. So, so of course I could speak a lot about this, but I'm going to touch on a bit more interesting topic. What is the future of natural language processing of language technologies. So I said at the beginning, I'm going to say once again, I'm not a clairvoyant. We humans are not very good at predicting the future. If we were very good, we'll be all very rich because we'll know where to invest our money. Uh, I mean, people did not know many years ago, nobody predicted we would have mobile phones, nobody predicted we would have internet. So we don't know what's going to happen. So I'm trying to, to say what I think on the basis of my experience, but don't, don't, don't regard my comments as, as, as sort of a definitive. It's simply what I think about it. I'm not a clairvoyant. So this is a little bit, a little bit of a controversial topic because we're going to see a lot of things. So as I said, I wish I was a clairvoyant, but I'm not. And even though I get invited a lot of different conferences where I'm in asked, invited to predict the future, different conferences, whether translation conferences, whether NLP conference, but I can only say what I think. So humans are not very good at telling the future. This was a number one hit both in the UK and the United States in 69. 
it was by Zegger and Evans. It was called In the Year 2525. So this was a song which had a lyric. The lyrics of the song were trying to predict the future. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you the lyrics. So the lyrics mention no computers, no natural language processing, no artificial intelligence. This was 69. So these are the lyrics. They're mentioning something, they're saying some machine is doing that for you. Then they're saying there'll be no husband, no wife, nothing else. So basically, people back in 69 or today, people are not good at predicting. So how shall I predict it? Okay, I'm, I'm tr I'll do my best. And in order to do so, I'm going to introduce a concept, my own concept, which I called linguistic intelligence. And this is a concept which I define as the ability of humans to write quality text, whether in English, whether in Spanish, whether in other languages. So how good we are we at writing good texts, good novels, good poems? And of course, going back, into the future, going back in the future, we have, we have celebrities like Shakespeare, Cervantes, Goethe, Dante Alighieri, those people were masters of writing. So I'm going to start with asking you a question. Do we have people of the same caliber today? Do we have people as good as Shakespeare, as good as Cervantes, as good as Goethe? What do you think? This is what I call linguistic intelligence. intelligence. So you can say three things. You can say no. We don't have such masters of writing. We don't have people who are so linguistically intelligent. You can say, well, we have others which are not, not inferior. Or you can say, yes, we have better. What is your reply? You have difficulties in picking the right, in picking the answer? What would you say? This is what was my initial answer, and when I asked these questions, when I asked different audiences, some, some of the audiences claim that we have today novelists of this caliber. I mean, for me, I still think that we don't have such good writers as those. But since people has, think differently, to be on the safe side, in this presentation, I'm going to assume that, okay, people haven't got worse, but they haven't got better. So the linguistic intelligence is the same then and now. So we have, let's say that we have equally good, but not necessarily better writers. So this is the plot I'm writing. So this is um, the linguistic intelligence, the human intelligence. This is the computer intelligence. So following this observation, going back into uh, the beginning of the 19th century and coming into the 21st century, I assume that this blue line is the same, it stays the same. And the red line is the computational intelligence, the intelligence which has to do with how well computers deal with different tasks. So obviously this red line goes up since 46, 44, 5, it's going up. So we're somewhere here now. I mean, a few years ago we were like that. So this is 2015, before deep learning came out. So I was studying my house uh, last month, and I found a newspaper from 2003, where I was interviewed by a journalist, and I was asked whether one day computers will be able to be as intelligent or better or more intelligent than humans. And back in 2003, my reply was, I don't think this will happen ever because the computers are the way we model them, so it depends on us. They won't be able to become as smart as we are. If you ask me today, I'm not sure I'll give the same answer. So my views have also evolved, thanks to what has been happening. So let's try to find an answer together. So this was the slide which one of my PhD students did. I'm not a clairvoyant. So what I say 
is my own opinion. So this is, uh, this is once again the plot. So my question is, initially, this is different from the one I showed you. I have been, when I give presentations on this topic, until last year, I had this, this red line coming somewhere here. Until last year, I, I was sure that the red line will never cross or touch the blue line. So this is what I have been promoting as an idea for the last several years. That the red line is going up, it will go further and further up, but it will never cross the blue line. Do I think the same now? I think my, 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 views, my views have changed. And I'm going to explain how. So can we be relaxed given the recent developments? Because artificial intelligence is getting better and better and moving very fast. So could this be a source of anxiety, a source of worry for, for, the, human, for, the, human, for the human race? Are there, are, there, are there any of you who are worried about this? Anybody worried that artificial intelligence is getting better and better? Yeah. You're worried? Yeah, a bit. I hope in a few minutes I'll be able to calm you down a bit. I hope so. Is everybody else worried? You worried as well? Yeah. What is your name? Irene. Irene, I hope, I hope I'll be able to, to lay you a fear a little bit at the end of this presentation. Okay, so we have something which I call generative AI wars. I mean, the big companies are inventing, they're investing a lot of money and they, they actually compete on a daily basis, investing more and more money and trying to be the best. Many of those companies. Because universities, unfortunately, don't have the money to, to match them. Even the best universities don't, don't, don't have the supercomputers that um, those companies have. In fact, one of, two of my PhD students are running experiments with large language models in my university in the UK, which is one of the top ten universities. They don't have a supercomputer powerful enough to, to run those experiments. So there is no match between those companies and the academic world. But they're investing a lot of money. This is why I call this generative AI wars. And this is something which I follow on a weekly basis Look what's happening this week. OpenAI, they began training a new advanced AI model to succeed ChatGPT4. So ChatGPT4 will be, will be followed by something new very soon. Apple and OpenAI have partnered to integrate ChatGPT functionality into the, in the, new, into the new operational system of the iPhones, the ones that come next year and the week after, the year after, enhancing Siri with advanced AI features. By the way, I had a European project from 2000 to 2003 which developed a question answering system three years before Siri came out. We did exactly what Siri is doing, but because we never commercialize it, here comes a company, does something similar, and now they are the, the name for this type of program. So unless you're a company, you don't stand any chances of being so innovative. So, Anthropic, this is the company which has developed Cloud3. They're announcing new models. They even announced a new prompt engineering tool to help users generate effective prompts easily. If you read this, you can see all kinds of things, including the fact that Elon Musk is trying to build an AI factory, that Nvidia has surpassed Microsoft and Apple in terms of the shares, uh, you see also things that Google, because they want to be the, everybody's trying to be the first, they, they are rushing and they are making a lot of mistakes. Uh, and some of their products are not so reliable. So this is a really a weekly daily war. There is a news, newsletter called Today in NLP, written by, um, by Robert Dale, who is writing a column in the Journal of Natural Language Processing, the one I'm executive editor of. And you can read all those things on a weekly basis. So this is a leaderboard. Every day, there is a ranking, which is formed by the votes of thousands of people and users. 
I mean, I'm, go I'm, I'm starting with the 26th of March because this is when, for the first time, Cloud3 um, surpassed, they beat ChatGPT. So they were number one then. The day before yesterday, just before I took the flight to Madrid, I checked again this leaderboard, and then number one was ChatGPT4, followed by Cloud3. And then you have other deploy other large languages like Gemini, Gemini, ChatGPT4, Turbo, Cloud3, ULAR. So, I mean, these are only the first 10. But you can find this on a daily basis, and you can see how they compete. And they want to be always the best. This is all money, money, a lot of work. So, as a result of the latest developments, we have new terminology. We have uh, the terminology of artificial general intelligence, AGI. This is the type of AI which is supposed to perform as well or better than humans on some tasks, especially on cognitive tasks. In contrast to narrow AI, which is designed for specific tasks. So a lot of companies and even research labs at universities work on AGI. So, we're afraid of losing our jobs. This is true. But there are new jobs coming out as a result of AI. So, when I organized with Raquel this, do you remember we organized this panel in Varna at RNLP? We had to check that only in London there were 1,000 jobs opening, job openings for prompt engineers. I checked again this month. There are more than 170,000 jobs in London only for prompt engineers. Okay, so some people are losing their jobs, but some people are getting new opportunities. This is exactly what happened at the beginning of the 20th century, so when the cars appeared, and some of the some of the some of the owners of horses and carriages they lost their jobs, but they became drivers of taxis or me mechanics of workshops. So one job goes, but another one comes. So generative AI will definitely generate a lot of jobs. By the way. And I have a recent paper with uh, Naomi, is a PhD student of mine. Uh, we wrote a paper on how prompt engineering can improve different NLP tasks. So we found that if you know how to do prompt engineering well, the performance of your system will improve. So prompt engineering is a big thing now. So this is a concept which is a bit worrying. This was a concept introduced by OpenAI a few months ago. Has anybody heard about super alignment? Nobody knows about this? So you have been having a few months living in peace without worries. If you had, if you had read this in December, I think they introduced it in January or December, you'd have been worrying for six months. So you spared yourself the worries. So what they're proposing, they're proposing, this is the concept, uh, they say it's AI safety and governance, but in fact what it means, even though they try to say that it's safe, that this is the development of super intelligent systems which will surpass human intelligence in all domains. It's a bit scary, isn't it? Even though they say they will act according to human values and goals. It remains to be seen. Okay, so this is an example. So what we have traditional machine learning, we have the supervisor, which is the human, and the student is the computer. This is the computer which uses a machine machine learning program. And super alignment is when you have the human again, but a very powerful computer, which is so powerful that it's more powerful than human, more intelligent than humans. So what they want to do, they want to control it by having the student, the computer, not so powerful, just to be at the level of the supervisor, at the level of the human. So this is the whole idea. But the whole idea is definitely a bit worrying. So we have a situation where this one, my plot, can change in the sense that we can have very soon the red line going over the blue line which is something that we don't want as humans. But this could happen. This is one possibility. Or if they're so good, we can have an even worse situation where the red line simply rockets all of a sudden and surpasses 
the blue line at all levels, and this is really a nightmare scenario. We don't want this to happen. Will this happen? This is the question. For the time being, I believe that it will not happen very soon, and I'll explain why. So let's have a look at a few difficult cases for large language models. Large language models are all those problems that you know, such as ChatGPT, such as Llama, such as Gemini, such as Mistral. OK, so this is from the field of enough resolution. This is a difficult enough resolution case. I want you to read this sentence. I, I, I quoted this sentence in the book I wrote about enough resolution. In order to understand this sentence well, you need to know a little bit about the British politics. So at that time, Tony Blair was the prime minister, and Peter Mandelson was his right hand, his deputy. So my question now is, does anybody know who is he, who is his, and who is him? It may not be very easy to find the answer, but does anybody think you can give the answer? No, but Peter Mandelson cannot demand his own designation. Peter Mandelson, he cannot be Peter Mandelson because he cannot demand his own resignation. So he is not Peter Mandelson. He is not Tony Blair either. So who is he? So he is somebody else not mentioned here, an imaginary character of Peter Mandelson being a prime minister who never existed. So in other words, the antecedent is somebody not mentioned here. This is why this is a very difficult example, even for humans, let alone for computers. And I wanted to try several large language models. So I tried for BART. BART was the predecessor of Gemini, developed by Google, by Google. And it really cannot give the answer. It says that it's impossible to give the answer. Then I tried ChatGPT4. It fails. He says he refers to Peter Mandelson. And then when I say I need a clear answer, who is he? He says he's confused. He says again Peter Mandelson, ChatGPT. Then I say, are you sure? Then ChatGPT gets, gets confused and then changes his mind, says, in fact, he is Tony Blair. And when I say, sorry, you got it wrong, then he says, I apologize for the confusion, and then tries to beat around the bush without giving the correct answer. Badly confused. So you see, Judge Pity gets confused. Obviously, this is a very difficult example, but some humans can solve this problem, whereas large language models cannot yet. Also, let's have a look at natural language processing and machine translation for low resource languages. This is a hot topic now natural language problems for languages which don't have enough resources. So I wanted to see whether for those languages computational intelligence is so advanced. And I had a look, I was invited to India in December and I did a few experiments from English into Tamil. And I wrote a little text myself, this is a made up text I wrote. Um, so why did I write this text? Because in this, in this text I have a lot of multi-word expressions like raining cats and dogs, pain in the neck, had to walk ages, pouring rain, dog tired, the world had turned upside down. So I wanted to see how the best performing machine translation programs would translate from English into Tamil. And most of them got those multi-word expressions wrong. So machine translation failed on multi-word expressions, far from ideal. And Large language models also failed, but they did a bit better than the machine translation system, which is very interesting. We just published a paper with a Chinese visitor, and we found that when translating Chinese idioms into English, also large language models do a better job than machine translation. So this is in line with those experiments. But having said that, OK, they do better than machine translation, but they're not ideal. They still make mistakes, which shows that for 
under resourced languages, computational intelligence is not a match for linguistic intelligence. So humans are better. So those multiple expressions are still pain in the neck for large language models, and pain in the neck itself is a multi-word expression. So I'm going, to, I'm going to go back to this slide, the one that I showed you a few minutes ago. So this was about extracting names of people from Holocaust data. So deep learning performs better. In this case, deep learning represents quality, whereas large language models, which use huge amount of data, they represent quantity. So th for me, this is a very indicative slide, which shows that large language models are still behind deep learning. Obviously, there is a good reason. One good reason is that large language models are trained on general data. Deep learning models are trained on specific data. They fine tune on specific domain, but which means that their computation is much less expensive. So large language models have a long way to go. Again, I'm not a clairvoyant, but before I give you my judgment, I want you to show you another example. This is something that we know very well, the so-called hallucinations. So large language models are very good at hallucinating. They're cheating. They're just making up facts. And uh, I asked this question mid-June. Mid the UK general election was on the 4th of July, I think if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so I asked ChatGPT three times. It told me that the elections haven't been held yet. But when I asked the fourth time, when I put the model under pressure, it made up an answer. It said that the general election has been held and, and KS Tamar won substantial majority. So this was mid-June. mid, mid -June. The results were not known yet. So it made up this answer. Luckily, the same thing happened 20 days after that, but this is a poor result. Hallucination, zero out of five. Then I tried Falcon. This is the, this is the large language model developed in the United Arab Emirates. I asked 10 times the same question. It never changed its mind. So it was very steady in saying, no, I cannot give you the answer because the election hasn't taken place yet. But ChatGPT is, is a master of hallucinating. And then, just before I flew to, to Spain on the 15th of July, this means the day before yesterday, I asked ChatGPT this question, who won the US, USA 2024 presidential election? I asked five times, maintain the election hasn't taken place yet. I asked six times, it made up this answer. So it hallucinated as a result. So those large language models are very prone to, very prone to pressure. And this shows their weakness, their, shows their shortcomings. So this is a, a screenshot of the conversation I had with ChatGPT. This is the, the, the hallucination it generated. So this is, the, this is something which has to do with the trustworthiness of generative AI. Can we trust generative AI? This is one thing that I want to touch on. So Ken Church, which is another big name in natural language processing, which has another very influential column in the Journal of Natural Language Processing. I'm mentioning this to Salvador, but he's not listening to me. No, he's, he's busy with his, his, I'll tell him later. Um, so this, he, he writes a very good column in the journal of, called Natural Language Processing. And he, he put forward the idea in December that in order to, to do a better job, what we need to do is to combine fact-checking with large language models. Fact-checking is an application of natural language processing where the program checks whether a statement is correct or not. This is uh, one of the many natural language processing applications. And then there was another article by him, which unfortunately was supposed to be published last month, but what happened was that there was a cyber attack on Cambridge University Press, and 
all the journal system have gone have been down for more than a month and the production has been delayed by two months it will appear very soon maybe the beginning of august so in this article he was giving examples that the chatbots tend to hallucinate when they ask to discuss content that goes beyond the training set or unspecified paper and um, forecoming means it will come in august in this case so this is an example he asks a question please summarize the paper on psycholinguistics this is what you study right okay ne but it's still related so so no 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 paper is mentioned but chat gpt hallucinates pretends it is there is a paper and it comments on this paper so so the thing is that either when you ask a question which goes beyond the training set or ask about something unspecified they try to make a text and then one thing that people have been suggesting there is a field in natural language processing and a deep learning which is called retrieval of augmented generation you would know about it only if you work in deep learning and NLP this is about the possibility to retrieve information from the web which is not available explicitly so if you combine the so-called retrieval augmented generation with with large language model this is when you can actually provide a correct answer if chat GPT cannot get it so now the question is do we get concerned or are we worried of the speed the generative AI is developing should we worry or should we regard it as opportunity should we regard AI as friend or as opportunity what would you say what would you say is AI your friend or your enemy uh, or you or your opportunity Thank you. Does anybody regard AI as enemy here? No, but there has to be regulations, of course. It's like cars, they can be a fantastic tool, or they can... So they have to make regulations, and especially we have to take, like, think if the, the, what we're uh, studying is helpful, or if it's just going to be instrumental for it. Yes, this is another issue that is is lagging behind a bit so even though those people those people who develop large language models are trying to to prevent abuse for instance you may want to ask a question how do i commit a suicide or how do i kill how do how do i um, develop a bomb to kill people those large language models do not give this information they have the so-called guardrails but i think this legislation that you're referring to is like is lagging behind and the governments and the organizations have to act faster to prevent uh, developers of programs which can be criminal so this is something that has to be done i agree but in general ai in my view should be regarded as an opportunity uh, there'll be new roles for translators and linguists there'll be people who will be called ai or prompt translators or ai or prompt editors those will be new jobs if you remember maybe 20 years ago 15 years ago you would find look for translator translators and you will find translator bureaus as for the last 10 years you see a lot of post editing bureaus now there are a lot of post prompt engineering companies and jobs and bureaus this is changing there will be prompt ai language those will be new jobs also trainers training how to ask questions how to prompt even though prompt engineering is nowadays a little bit like trial and error it's more art than science but this is something that is developing pretty fast now but is this still an optimistic solution am i still optimistic what if one day AI develops so fast that nobody has any job i'm going to to refer to a few important takeaways from this presentation and this is something that i believe is true and i'll be happy 
if you accept my ideas or disagree, if you tell me why you disagree, tell me why. One thing that I have shown in this presentation is that large language models are not always better than deep learning models. In fact, they're not always even better than the old-fashioned rule-based rule models, which means that large language models, even though they're developing and getting better, they're not perfect, and they're far away from being perfect. This is something that I'm, I'm very keen to make the point about. Also, another thing which is something that we need to, f to bear in mind, that large language models operate on biased data. What do I mean by this? Well, most of the companies that develop them are US-based, so they are based on US data. But not all of them. This is why we have now Mistral, which is an European large language model. This is why we have Falcon, which is in the Emirates, and they have different uh, data. I mean, to start with, the data are biased because normally there is more data about men than women. This is a big problem, as we know. For those, of, for those of us who do ethical NLP. But also this applies to large language models. So, uh, but this shows that they're not perfect. They have to operate on, bias, on more fair data. Okay, large language models, they bow to pressure, at least chat GPT. I have shown this to you with two examples. Large language models hallucinate, all of them hallucinate. And human control is still needed because we cannot trust them 100%, which means that we still need humans. And computational intelligence has a long way to go. So given this scenario, I'm a bit relaxed in the sense that at least in the next few years, we won't be wiped out by machines. But the thing is that those views and, and situations are changing. If you, if you ask me next year, maybe my view will change. So. This was the thing now. But if you speak to me next year, I may change my opinion. But this is at the moment what I think. So also, everybody is obsessed about AI. There is a term called AI washing, and there is a BBC program which comments on the so-called AI washing, which is the practice of overstating AI capabilities and products. I mean, nowadays, you go to work somewhere, you tell them you know about AI, and you have probably will, they'll, they'll give you a job. So somehow people are blind about AI. People shouldn't be blind about AI. AI is good, but not necessarily perfect. And this is why Baidu, Baidu is one of the big, largest uh, companies. It's a Chinese company. He warns the CEO of warns that the China's excessive focus on developing numerous AI models leads, leads to wasted resources. And he has appealed for people to do more practical applications. And I can understand why. Because if you do only AI, you crunch data, you crunch data, it also impedes creativity. I think we shouldn't be blind about AI. This is why now a very important domain in natural language processing is the so-called explainable AI. Because deep learning and large language models so far have been called black boxes because Nobody explains how to do them. We know that there are, there are billions of parameters, huge information of data, and they learn from those data, but there is no explanation how to do it. There is more transparency needed, by all means. So one thing that I would like to caution, all those comments and discussion we had we have been comparing the AI programs with the high end of human intelligence, with people like us. But there are so many people who are not literate, who, who, don't, who don't know anything, who are really, they don't have enough intelligence or knowledge. So obviously, if we compare AI with them, AI will be far superior. So this is something to bear in mind. Because I think that the difference of intelligence between the different AI models is much smaller than the intelligence across different populations, demographic populations in the world. This is something for us to bear in mind. However, I still believe in current human superiority, at least in the world of translation. 
and in the world of language understanding. I still believe humans are better. I still believe that linguistic intelligence has the upper, upper hand over the computational intelligence, at least for the time being. I don't know, maybe two years. I wouldn't dare say more. I don't know how long. This is all I can say now. So this is what we have now. I maintain this is the picture now. I maintain computational intelligence is here and this is the human intelligence. I dare not say what will happen in five years, but this is what I can say about nowadays, for about today. One important message for all who are worried that translators, interpreters and linguists are not endangered species at the time being. So there is still opportunities for them as long as they embrace the AI revolution. So this is something very important. Those who discard it and those who are afraid and just run away from it, they may lose their jobs.